Part 2 Chapter 2 The House of Aquila. Presently there came the sound of a creaking axle, which grew louder and louder as the wagon drew nearer, till it approached a shriek. The sleeper moved uneasily, but recognizing the noise even in his dreams, did not wake. The horrible sound stopped. There was the sound of voices, as if two persons, one without and one within the wall, were hailing each other. A gate swung open, and the wagon came past under the very window of the bedroom. Even habit could not enable Felix to entirely withstand so piercing a noise when almost in his ears. He sat up a minute, and glanced at the square of light on the wall to guess the time by its position. In another minute or two the squeaking of the axle ceased, as the wagon reached the storehouses, and he immediately returned to the pillow. Without, and just beneath the window, there ran a road or way, which in part divided the enclosure into two portions, the dwelling house and its offices being on one side, the granaries and storehouses on the other. But a few yards to the left of his room, a strong gate in the enclosing wall gave entrance to this roadway. It was called the Maple Gate, because a small maple tree grew near outside. The wall, which surrounded the whole place at a distance of eight or ten yards from the buildings, was of brick, and about nine feet high, with a ditch without. It was partly embattled, and partly loopholed, and a banquet of earth rammed hard ran all round inside so that the defenders might discharge darts or arrows through the embrasures, and step down out of sight to prepare a fresh supply. At each corner there was a large platform, where a considerable number of men could stand and command the approaches. There were, however, no bastions or flanking towers. On the roof of the dwelling house a similar platform had been prepared, protected by a parapet, from which height the entire enclosure could be overlooked. Another platform, though at a less height, was on the roof of the retainer's lodgings, so placed as especially to command the second gate. Entering by the Maple Gate, the dwelling house was on the right hand, and the granaries and general storehouses on the left, the latter built on three sides of a square. Farther on, on the same side, were the stables, and near them the forge and workshops. Beyond these, again, were the lodgings of the retainers and laborers, near which, in the corner, was the south gate, from which the south road led to the cattle pens and farms, and out to the south. Upon the right hand, after the dwelling house, and connected with it, came the steward's stores, where the iron tools and similar valuable articles of metal were kept. Then, after a covered passageway, the kitchen and general hall, under one roof with the house, the house fronted in the opposite direction to the roadway. There was a narrow green lawn between it and the enceinte, or wall, and before the general hall and kitchens a graveled court. This was parted from the lawn by pawlings, so that the house folk enjoyed privacy, and yet were close to their servitors. The place was called the Old House, for it dated back to the time of the ancients, and the Aquilas were proud of the simple designation of their fortified residence. Felix's window was almost exactly opposite the entrance to the storehouse or granary yard, so that the wagon, after passing it, had to go but a little distance, and then, turning to the left, was drawn up before the doors of the warehouse. This wagon was low, built for the carriage of goods only, of hewn planks scarcely smooth, and the wheels were solid, cut, in fact, from the butt of an elm tree. Unless continually greased the squeaking of such wheels as terrible, and the carters frequently forgot their grease horns. Much of the work of the farm, such as the carting of hay and corn in harvest time, was done upon sleds. The wagons, there were but few of them, being reserved for longer journeys on the rough roads. This wagon, laden with wool, some of the season's clip, had come in four or five miles from an outlying cot, or sheep pen, at the foot of the hills. In the buildings round the granary yard there were stored not only the corn and flour required for the retainers, who might at any moment become a besieged garrison, but the most valuable products of the estate, the wool, hides, and tanned leather from the tan pits, besides a great quantity of bacon and salt beef. Indeed, 
every possible article that could be needed. These buildings were put together with wooden pins, on account of the scarcity of iron, and were all, dwelling houses included, roofed with red tile. Lesser houses, cottages, and sheds at a distance were thatched, but in an enclosure tiles were necessary, lest, in case of an attack, fire should be thrown. Half an hour later, at six o'clock, the watchman blew his horn as loudly as possible for some two or three minutes, the hollow sound echoing through the place. He took the time by the sundial on the wall, it being a summer morning, in winter he was guided by the position of the stars, and often, when sun or stars were obscured, went by guess. The house horn was blown thrice a day, at six in the morning, as a signal that the day had begun, at noon as a signal for dinner, at six in the afternoon as a signal that the day, except in harvest time, was over. The watchman went there round about the enclosure all night long, relieved every three hours, armed with spears, and attended by mastiffs. By day one sufficed, and his station was then usually, though not always, on the highest part of the roof. The horn re-awoke Felix, it was the note by which he had been accustomed to rise for years. He threw open the oaken shutters, and the sunlight and the fresh breeze of the May morning came freely into the room. There was now the buzz of voices without, men unloading the wool, men at the workshops and in the granaries, and others waiting at the door of the steward's store for the tools, which he handed out to them. Iron being so scarce, tools were a temptation, and were carefully locked up each night, and given out again in the morning. Felix went to the ivory cross and kissed it in affectionate recollection of Aurora, and then looked towards the open window, in the pride and joy of youth turning to the east, the morning, and the light. Before he had half-dressed there came a knock and then an impatient kick at the door. He unbarred it, and his brother Oliver entered. Oliver had been for his swim in the river. He excelled in swimming, as, indeed, in every manly exercise, being as active and energetic as Felix was outwardly languid. His room was only across the landing, his door just opposite. It also was strewn with implements and weapons. But there was a far greater number of tools. He was an expert and artistic workman, and his table and his seat, unlike the rude blocks in Felix's room, were tastefully carved. His seat, too, had a back, and he had even a couch of his own construction. By his bedhead hung his sword, his most valued and most valuable possession. It was one which had escaped the dispersion of the ancients. It had been ancient even in their days, and of far better work than they themselves produced. Broad, long, straight, and well balanced, it appeared capable of cutting through helmet and mail, when wielded by Oliver's sturdy arm. Such a sword could not have been purchased for money. Money, indeed, had often been offered for it in vain. Persuasion, and even covert threats from those higher in authority who coveted it, were alike wasted. The sword had been in the family for generations, and when the baron grew too old, or rather when he turned away from active life, the second son claimed it as the fittest to use it. The claim was tacitly allowed, at all events, he had it, and meant to keep it. In a corner stood his lance, long and sharp, for use on horseback, and by it his saddle and accoutrements. The helmet and the shirt of mail, the iron greaves and spurs, the short iron mace to bang at the saddlebow, spoke of the knight, the man of horses and war. Oliver's whole delight was in exercise and sport. The boldest rider, the best swimmer, the best at leaping, at hurling the dart or the heavy hammer, ever ready for tilt or tournament, his whole life was spent with horse, sword, and lance. A year younger than Felix, he was at least ten years physically older. He measured several inches more round the chest. His massive shoulders and immense arms, brown and hairy, his powerful limbs, tower-like neck, and somewhat square jaw were the natural concomitants of enormous physical strength. All the blood and bone and thew and sinew of the house seemed to have fallen to his share. All the fiery, restless spirit and defiant temper all the utter recklessness and warrior's instinct. 
He stood every inch a man, with dark, curling, short-cut hair, brown cheek and Roman chin, trimmed mustache, brown eye, shaded by long eyelashes and well-marked brows, every inch a natural king of men. That very physical preponderance and animal beauty was perhaps his bane, for his comrades were so many, and his love adventures so innumerable, that they left him no time for serious ambition. Between the brothers there was the strangest mixture of affection and repulsion. The elder smiled at the excitement and energy of the younger. The younger openly despised the studious habits and solitary life of the elder. In time of real trouble and difficulty they would have been drawn together. As it was, there was little communion. The one went his way, and the other his. There was perhaps rather an inclination to detract from each other's achievements than to praise them, a species of jealousy or envy without personal dislike, if that can be understood. They were good friends, and yet kept apart. Oliver made friends of all, and thwacked and banged his enemies into respectful silence. Felix made friends of none, and was equally despised by nominal friends and actual enemies. Oliver was open and jovial. Felix reserved and contemptuous, or sarcastic in manner. His slender frame, too tall for his width, was against him. He could neither lift the weights nor undergo the muscular strain readily borne by Oliver. It was easy to see that Felix, although nominally the eldest, had not yet reached his full development. A light complexion, fair hair and eyes, were also against him. Where Oliver made conquests, Felix was unregarded. He laughed, but perhaps his secret pride was hurt. There was but one thing Felix could do in the way of exercise and sport. He could shoot with the bow in a manner till then entirely unapproached. His arrows fell unerringly in the center of the target. The swift deer and the hare were struck down with ease, and even the wood pigeon in full flight. Nothing was safe from those terrible arrows. For this, and this only, his fame had gone forth, and even this was made a source of bitterness to him. The nobles thought no arms worthy of men of descent but the sword and lance. Missile weapons, as the dart and arrow, were the arms of retainers. His degradation was completed when, at a tournament, where he had mingled with the crowd, the prince sent for him to shoot at the butt, and display his skill among the soldiery, instead of with the knights in the tilting ring. Felix shot, indeed, but shut his eyes that the arrow might go wide, and was jeered at as a failure even in that ignoble competition. Only by an iron self-control did he refrain that day from planting one of the despised shafts in the prince's eye. But when Oliver joked him about his failure, Felix asked him to hang up his breastplate at 200 yards. He did so, and in an instant a shaft was sent through it. After that Oliver held his peace, and in his heart began to think that the bow was a dangerous weapon. So you are late again this morning, said Oliver, leaning against the recess of the window, and placing his arms on it. The sunshine fell on his curly dark hair, still wet from the river. Studying last night, I suppose? Turning over the parchment. Why didn't you ride into town with me? The water must have been cold this morning, said Felix, ignoring the question. Yes, there was a slight frost, or something like it, very early, and a mist on the surface but it was splendid in the pool. Why don't you get up and come? You used to. I can swim, said Felix laconically, implying that, having learnt the art, it no more tempted him. You were late last night. I heard you put night in. We came home in style. It was rather dusky, but night galloped the green miles. Mind she doesn't put her hoof in a rabbit's hole, some night. Not that, she can see like a cat. I believe we got over the twelve miles in less than an hour. Sharp work, considering the hills. You don't inquire for the news. What's the news to me? Well, there was a quarrel at the palace yesterday afternoon. The prince told Louis he was a double-faced traitor, and Louis told the prince he was a suspicious fool. It nearly came to blows, and Louis is banished. For the fiftieth time, this time it is more serious. 
don't believe it. He will be sent for again this morning. Cannot you see why? No. If the prince is really suspicious, he will never send his brother into the country, where he might be resorted to by discontented people. He will keep him close at hand. I wish the quarreling would cease. It spoils half the fun. One's obliged to creep about the court and speak in whispers, and you can't tell whom you are talking to. They may turn on you if you say too much. There is no dancing either. I hate this moody state. I wish they would either dance or fight. Fight? Who? Anybody. There's some more news, but you don't care. No, I do not. Why don't you go and live in the woods all by yourself? Said Oliver, in some heat. Felix laughed. Tell me your news. I am listening. The Irish landed at Blacklands the day before yesterday, and burnt Robert's place. They tried Letburn, but the people there had been warned, and were ready. And there's an envoy from Cypolis arrived. Some think the assembly has broken up. They were all at daggers drawn. So much for the Holy League. So much for the Holy League, repeated Felix. What are you going to do today? asked Oliver, after a while. I am going down to my canoe, said Felix. I will go with you. The trout are rising. Have you got any hooks? There's some in the box there, I think. Take the tools out. Oliver searched among the tools in the open box, all rusty and covered with dust, while Felix finished dressing, put away his parchment, and knotted the thong round his chest. He found some hooks at the bottom, and after breakfast they walked out together, Oliver carrying his rod, and a boar spear, and Felix a boar spear also, in addition to a small flag basket with some chisels and gouges.